All right. And now to give us a little bit of why innovation matters on the call, we have uh, the Director of Office of Education Outreach, Joyce Word, and we also have Juan Valentin. And I know that Joyce has a few other colleagues here. So Joyce, if you don't mind chiming in and introducing them and kind of going, you know, big picture, why does innovation matter? Why is the USPTO invested in this? Okay, absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Adam and uh, Jay, for inviting um, the USPTO to participate in your inaugural uh, distance learning uh, program. Uh, on the line with us, we have Juan Valentin, who you mentioned, and we also have Tanaga Boozer, who is Boozer, who is also an education program advisor, Jorge Valdez, and I believe Christopher Dulcy, who is a program analyst in our office. We are small but mighty. You actually have the entire education and outreach team here with you on the call. Um, there are, um, as I said, five of us. But um, why innovation uh, uh, matters, uh, we think that uh, it is critical that students as well as parents and teachers uh, have an understanding of intellectual property and how it relates to the things that we create and build and design and, and do, um, but also uh, our students and our teachers need to be more aware of how you go about protecting those and how you go about using uh, those items when they are, when they are in um, the marketplace or just sharing with a neighbor or a friend, uh, just certain basics that we feel like people need to know to be more uh, literate about intellectual property. All right, thank you very much. And then also on um, this next slide, um, there's a little bit here about your National um, Summer Teacher Institute and other USPTO um, resources that you have here. Do you mind sh uh, just talking briefly about those so when folks go through the PDF, they can click on the links and find out more? Joyce, um, do, you, do you mind sharing about the resources? Um, oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so the first link there is to the USPTO's main uh, page that takes you to uh, the USPTO in uh, general website. Uh, we have lots of information there. The first thing you'll see on the screen is, are you new to the USPTO? And you'll see a menu of different options uh, to give you an idea of what part of the site you want to go, go to. Uh, USPTO.gov uh, forward slash kids uh, is the USPTO's uh, kids pages where you'll find resources for students but also for teachers and parents as well. Uh, we are very impressed with Oregon State. They minded and found uh, some items that uh, we haven't seen in a long time. So very, very happy uh, that they are, that those materials are being used. Um, the next uh, link there is uh, Inventor, kid inventors or young inventors. Uh, that section of the website has stories of young inventors uh, that uh, you can utilize to introduce students to uh, students who are inventing. A lot of times people may think that, oh, you made an invention, that's very cute, or you entered this competition, but we want students and parents and teachers to know that students really are uh, creating things that they then go on to seek patents on and that they start businesses that um, they're entering and uh, winning all different types of competitions. They're coming up with devices uh, that change their environment or their neighborhood, or maybe it's a device that helps their grandfather or their grandmother. And so um, we think it's really important to tell the story of young inventors. So on the kids site, you'll find stories of young inventors. Um, but you'll find stories of inventors woven throughout the USPTO website. Uh, we have our Science of Innovation resource, uh, which is a, a group of videos that talks about um, the connection between basic research, R&D, and innovation. Uh, those are usually uh, mid, early to mid-career scientists and engineers who are involved in invention, inventing and who have innovated various products. Uh, in addition to the science of innovation, we also have a series called Journeys of Innovation, which you'll find on the USPTO's main website, and that uh, follows the journeys of different people who have been engaged um, with intellectual property and with 
um, the invention process. Um, again, you'll see the story of inventors woven throughout the USPTO website. We think it's very important that people know that inventors come from every walk of life. Um, they have differing abilities. They are women, they are men, they are from rural America, they are from urban areas, they're from all over, and yes, suburban, suburban areas too. Um, and so we think it's very important that all of our students have the opportunity to see and know uh, that their ideas have tremendous potential and what they do with those ideas um, when they translate those into something tangible or something that can be reproduced, that there are opportunities um, to not only celebrate them, but also to share them with others, sometimes to commercialize them as well. And uh, the uh, last program that I will uh, mention is our National Summer Teacher Institute. This is an annual program of the USPTO. Um, we are now in our seventh year. Uh, this is essentially a boot camp for educators. It is open to K-12 educators throughout the country. And uh, we bring teachers to um, a, a uh, location for a week-long training uh, where they learn about um, intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets in the context of uh, STEM education and in the context of um, integration, how they can integrate uh, making um, entrepreneurship, how they can take a number of different skills that they may already be doing in the classroom and uh, modify those to help students have a broader understanding of uh, literacy, intellectual property literacy. And those are some of the types of activities that I think um, you'll see today with uh, Oregon State University. Mm -hmm. So we are currently accepting applications for the National Summer Teacher Institute, uh, and we would welcome applications from all of you. Awesome. All right, and with that in mind, we're gonna transition right into connection to the Oregon Distance Learning for All. And one you'll see a lot of here, building on what Joyce said about um, things in the classroom you may already doing, um, <clears throat> innovation, and at least the way that we're gonna present it here, uh, we're gonna try to present it very relevant to students. We'll be talking about household items, hopefully ones that they've already been interacting with. Um, we see innovation as really a good opportunity for interdisciplinary and well-rounded learning. Um, and it aligns with K-12 standards. For the NGSS ones, it's um, the ones about society, technology, um, and innovation and how they kind of all build on each other as we move forward and change over time and our needs and wants. And then also with the common core uh, standards. So thinking about um, a lot of those evidence-based explanations, pulling things from text or using pictures or imagery to enhance the story um, as kind of evidence. Um, so we're gonna see some activities that have independent research in them, interviewing a family member, drawing and creating, and then some critical reading or critical literacy. Also, it's important to understand we won't be addressing this here, but within this, it came out with nutrition and wellness is also being another thing that teachers should attend uh, to so far as mealtime and physical wellness. Um, so trying to make activities active is also something that's very important. All right, so let's look at the first lesson. Okay. Um, oh, in the chat. Um, just getting off your chest. So what do you expect students to have access to at home. So think chat and share. So think for a moment, reply in the chat, and then I'll read out a few answers and really want to focus on what they have. So this could be kind of an asset based thinking. Um, we can maybe go with a place based approach. So what do they have there. So think about it. I'm going to mute myself so I don't keep talking and then reply in the chat. All right, go ahead and start replying. Okay, Julie students have internet and a Chromebook, arts and crafts materials, iPads, laptops. All right, all right, and it is gonna change variously from school. And I would like to expand on that to think about a little bit, not just about the materials, um, but also we want to think about other resources. So either technology, such as items they can look at that have been innovative, but also thinking about the people. Ooh, 3D printer, not even scissors or glue. Um, they have families and siblings. Yep. And those families and siblings probably have professions. 
Um, so other areas of expertise maybe you could pull on. Um, I bet in, depending on which communities you're from, you may know all the parents in the class. Um, you may not know some, but yeah. Pine cones, pine, yes, nature. The students definitely have nature outside. Ooh, without Wi-Fi, yeah. So thinking about ways we can adapt those packets. All right, we're gonna be highlighting those here. Yeah, access to people and resources. Um, you know, it might be a neighbor, it might be someone they can Skype, uh, it might be a family member they can talk to. Yeah, cardboard, nature, and duct tape. Yes, definitely. Recycled materials, so items that don't take away from things that they're using. Um, all right. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing. That was just kind of get us started. Um, so let's get to this then, our first activity. Yep, I saw all these one school platforms, internet packets. Um, I didn't see anyone mention pets yet. Uh, but I think pets are an interesting way to learn life cycles or metabolism. Oh, green space, nature. All right. Excellent. So the first activity is who are innovators? Um, this is a reflection activity. Um, students will watch a video. There's a guided reflection that comes along with that. Um, and then let's move right into it. And in this reflection activity, we talk about who do you think innovators are? So just reply in chat. If you just told your students who they think innovators are, who would they say? Uh, would they say like a music star, or like Billie Eilish? Um, who would they say if you were like, who's an innovator? Tell me one. My dad. My dad, yeah? Yeah, my dad owned a business, so he might be an innovator. Scientists, anyone else? Elon Musk, rich people, my kids. then act on it. Yeah, new things. So that idea of novelty, all of these folks that we've mentioned have, have this idea of novelty, unique things, things that have value, meaning my siblings. Yeah. My daughter says Einstein. Excellent. I don't my I don't know what my kid would say. <laughs> um, so in this one, they go over innovators and they look at extreme sports. So in this video, um, it's linked in all the materials that you've had. They'll see um, examples from say Roxy, designing fashion, um, cambered skis that allow folks like me who, you know, are like a Sunday skier. I like downhill skis, but now since the, the ski has a nice bend in it, I can go and ski powder. So it makes people that are me like novice be able to ski powder like experts. So they'll see those examples. They'll also see an example of a uh, bicycle where the rotors for the gears that can spin 360, they, uh, they kind of come up with new rotors to do all those crazy tricks that they see in the X Games. And with this kind of version, what you will see is this connection between like societal wants and needs and athletes in particular wanting to push their sports and then scientists and engineers coming up with new technology to allow them to do these crazy things. Um, like in the X Games now, people do backflips on snowmobiles, which is crazy. Um, but they had to come up with some safety equipment, some snowmobiles, some probably engineering some jumps. But so kind of to get the students thinking. And then also, there is a whole offline PDF. So if your students are only able to watch that video or get a transcript of that video, there is a much longer curriculum that is geared towards middle school students that looks at more detailed patenting. Um, so that is a resource that we have shared that you're emailed and is also available online. All right, and then now we're gonna move on quickly to the other activities, which are a little bit more hardier. This one's kind of an introduction. Um, and the next one is inter, uh, innovation timeline. And this one, the students are focusing on interviewing. Um, they're gonna wanna interview someone who has interacted you know, with a space, so in their house. Um, maybe they've seen something old change over time, uh, or maybe they act with the same thing differently. So generally they're looking for someone older, someone younger, um, intergenerational, so maybe they Skype uh, older cousins or um, other family members they have, perhaps in other countries, but wherever they could use kind of that telecommunications, or they could just call them on the phone and be like, hey, what do you use? Um, and that is important because they're gonna talk about these things. And what we want them to think about in this prompt is changes in societal needs and wants over time. And so those changes in what society needs and wants also goes along with advances in science and engineering that result in new technologies. So there's kind of a then moment of something, then there's innovation that happens over time, and then there's the now of how I experience it. So I'm experiencing technology different than say someone who lived say 20 or 30 years ago experienced their technology. 
And so in this activity, we ask students to really think deeply about that. And so we're going to do a breakout session really quick because in this innovation timeline, the students kind of think about how we're using the example of a smoke alarm. They're probably all in your houses if you're staying home. Um, if your home was built, I think after the 1960s or 70s. So here's a picture, um, super heavy duty supercell battery. I don't know if that's an original battery, but here's an older one from the 1970s. You can look at, you know, consider materials, use, size. But then in 1995, how did these kind of smoke alarms change? Um, and then thinking about today's modern smoke alarms, um, you know, these ones have certain, I see hard wiring here. This one I see symbol for wireless. Um, so in a moment, um, I would like you to have to do kind of a breakout of thinking about, you know, how has a smoke alarm changed? And while you're in that breakout for about five minutes, I would like you to think about um, how the smoke alarms change and then what could be a good thing for students to look at in their household. If you said, hey, I want you to find something that is innovated over time, something that has changed over time, what do you think they might pick out? Um, and then who might be a good person to talk to? I heard folks say scientists, parents, siblings. Um, so who might them be, see, be a talk to? Because what the goal of this activity is, is kind of pull apart, how has this thing changed? And if they know how it's changed, they know how their interaction has changed. I know that my interactions with a smoke alarm are usually awful because it's at some uncomfortable time where it went off, it's beeping, I have to get a ladder out, I have to get up to the tall ceilings, I have to pull it out. I hope it's not in like, you know, two, three in the morning. So as you go into it, uh, these breakouts, think about what is something in your uh, students' households that they could look at and innovate? And you know, how might that have changed kind of like this smoke alarm? All right, so if we can get kind of pushed into those breakouts, Dominique, that would be great. And we'll have our first breakout session. Yeah. Awesome, so um, if you don't mind in the chat as you're joining back in, just jot down some things that you uh, talked about with your group. So the item maybe, and also the person that they could talk to. Um, you know, who's someone that, that you could, that you feel comfortable like, hey, go talk to so-and-so about this equipment that they use for their job and think about how that has changed. Um, so what are some things that came up in your cell phones? Yeah, cell phones. <laughs> oh man, there's a whole lot right there. Appliances. Yep, talking with grandparents. Uh, what do you do in the house? That's help you with certain point, the doorbell, video games. Yep. And so uh, back to the example here that I, in case you decide to use it with your stuff, um, this next slide that I have is what I learned about oh. the smoke alarm and what I did and some of these obsolete phone book. Yeah, kindling, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things that became obsolete. Um, but also, um, so here I have a, the smoke alarms. And what I did about this is I looked online um, and I looked at the history of the smoke alarm. I also pulled up First Alert. I noticed the brand name, First Alert, and I thought like, what did, what have they been doing? And these are some facts that I found. Um, so 1970s, um, that was about when these first started and it was $125 for smoke alarm. They're generally for industrial use, commercial use. Um, who works for the USPTO. He helped do the spot the invention activity that we'll see later on. And there's a patent actually of a smoke alarm on it that helps with this kind of optical read that sees how cloudy kind of the air is getting, uh, what particles are in it. And that's what triggers the alarm. So you have to actually like blow in it. And that's when I realized why I've always seen people kind of like fanning a smoke alarm to get it out. It's actually the, the smoke thickness that it's reading. Uh, but then we got reduction in cost and size. And so 1995, 10-year lithium ion battery. So this is when we first got our first operated ones. I think also around this time, uh, they began being standard and hardware. I believe they became uh, somewhere, I think before 1995, they became standard in houses. Um, so beyond commercial and industrial use. And when I looked up, um, this is uh, just a picture here. I think it's from Home Depot. I just wanted to see like, what is the most amazing smoke detector I can today? And it has Wi-Fi. So how I told the story about always having an impromptu time when it's dying and low battery and I have to get up and change them, this will actually send you an alert and tell you you need to change your battery. And also carbon monoxide is sometimes forwarded into these. So thinking about the carbon monoxide, how it has changed. Um, yeah, and another group offered mentioned music. So music, musical instruments. So just thinking about how has something changed? Um, you know, 
pre-1970s, um, you know, if smoke was going off in a fire in your household, uh, safe because there was nothing to notify you. Because there's nothing to notify you, you can feel safer at home. You know when they go off. I heard my neighbors going off the other day and I was wondering what was going on. They're probably cooking Sunday dinner or something. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, how have these changed and prompting them to talk to someone. Um, I think something that could be really good here could also be heirlooms. So things that they've kept, things that they've used and things that haven't changed. Um, because in this prompt, it'll ask them to think about, you know, what is one key advancement that it had that moved it from where it was uh, about 50 years ago to where it is now? And then what's probably an in-between stage? And if the students pick a household item, there's a good chance moving to the next activity. Um, we can talk about this at all. I, I saw you folks thinking about the, the people, parents, grandparents, and so on. So we're going to move past this slide real quick. Um, but that brings us to the spot the invention. So um, spot the invention talks about patents. And what we're going to, I'm going to go up just a little bit. And what that does is they can go to USPTO spot the invention and click on these ones and twos and tens and they can pull up a patent for each of them. So this patent asks them to read about it, um, to read about it, but they only have to pull out key information to be successful at this. So things such as what's the, what's the patent date, um, and then if they think it's similar to an invite, an item they have in their own house. Up here, I think it's number 20 or number 21. One of those is an actual smoke alarm. And then I think number 14 and 15 down here, one of those is an actual video game system, um, like a really old one. And this is like a plasma uh, or it might be an LCD TV. Um, so these are kind of what I would call like keystone patents. Um, so they have to think about and read them and think about if their item in their house is similar or different to the patent that they found um, through USPTO spot, uh, spot the Invention activity. And so within that, um, they get to bring in a lot of that kind of critical literacy and then make a claim about if this the same or different than what this is. The offline version of this activity, which Joyce and Juan were able to provide, is the same image, but students would go through and they'd circle everything that they thought um, was a product kind of innovation and history and then they kind of flip it over and then they'd see kind of the matching patterns of if they were able to pick them out. This is a picture of a living room. Um, and that's what's done for the online activity. Um, but there's also different images of a classroom and images of a street view. So they see things like electric cars in that one, generators, uh, um, kind of cable cell towers. So those sorts of things are also there. So this is kind of uh, like a seek and find kind of an activity. And in these patents, if you look at this one right here, right, that's the patent that I pulled out of the fire alarm box. Um, what you see here, and folks from the USPTO, feel free to chime in um, on this information. Um, but names, you'll see some details, numbers, drawings, pictures, languages, you'll see some diagrams. Um, pictures are kind of, other. Juan and I were talking and Joyce about the other day of like, are these essential? So apparently pictures can be given, they're kept on disk for some of the older ones, but they're not essential. Usually they prefer hand-drawn drawings and diagrams. And so Juan or Joyce, um, if you'd like to chime in and kind of say, you know, what else is there looking at patents? And maybe see, you know, what, how does the USPTO make these patents? What, what role do they play in innovation? Yeah, hi everybody, this is Juan. Uh, so just real quick backtracking to the, the previous slide, I, the idea that intellectual property is everywhere, I think is um, a really critical uh, component to, to the aspect of, of what we're trying to, to teach students and, and teachers, adults as well, is the fact that we go through our daily lives and we use all of these inventions, but we never really stop to think like, man, this, this came from somebody's head. Like this, this was an idea that was turned into something real and tangible that we physically touch or interact with on a daily basis, but we never really think about the origin of, of what we're using, right? And so these pictures really bring to life everyday items in our houses, in our classrooms, and everywhere in between. And, and it really is not for history purposes. I mean, it really cross um, technology, it just really crosses a lot of different discipline areas um, to pique the curiosity within our students. Um, and so I think it's just really great to, to be able to touch on these points and have, have them learn in this way. Uh, but yeah, and so in terms of patents and innovation, um, I really 
this patent cover, um, and we, we have an anatomy of a patent that we can share as well. But basically, this has a lot of great information on it from the inventor's name, which you can see at the um, listed at the very top where it says inventors and where they're from. Um, and then you have the filing date of the patent. So that's the date the actual patent application was filed. And then you have the issue date, which says that where the cursor is now. That's the actual date that the patent was issued. Um, and the abstract is a great little starting jumping off point for the actual invention. And it's just a quick description of the invention and a little bit about um, what, it, what it's about. Uh, and so the diagram is also below. You don't see it. It's, it's chopped off there. But um, every patent needs a diagram because patents are, they explain to people how to make and use the inventions. And so that document is literally a technical document that describes um, to people exactly how to make and use that invention every single component of it from the screws um, to how two surfaces meet and form with each other to, to function in a certain way or accomplish a, a specific task or process. Um, so it's a very cool, cool document. Um, and I don't know, Tanaga or Joyce, Jorge, if you want to add anything, Chris? Oh, that was perfect. Thanks, Juan. Yeah, and to, and to, um, to give you an idea, um, there's the one of the classroom in there. There's projectors, there's smart boards, um, and in there, there's even a blue recycling bin. And that patent is on the composition of the chemicals that were made to use that plastic. So you can get very detailed with these patents and they're, they're, they're so ubiquitous. It is really everywhere. All right, so that is the um, spot the invention activity. Um, and like I said, there's an online version of this and an offline version. And it's kind of just building on that idea, starting back again, thinking of who are innovators? Where did they come from? What do they do? Seeing kind of that popular culture imagery of X Games and then coming, really focusing on that kind of play space or funds of knowledge. Like what is this in my house that I'm using? And like, how has that changed? So trying to look, make it, breathe that awareness to the, the rich context of their lives, the rich technological and innovative context of their life. All right. So next, well, we're already here. I'm gonna check my time. Ooh, we're doing real good on time. Yay. Um, so claimed invention. Um, so this was developed by USPTO. This is an awesome activity. It's one of my favorite activities that I've done um, just because it's so, it's so much of a deductive logical reasoning activity. Um, and in this, um, so thinking back, we asked the students to reflect early on. We had them interview someone um, explore a patent, kind of a, um, thinking about that. And then now we're going to ask them to create. So how are they going to create something? Um, and to give you an idea, um, the claimed invention, there will be some, I'm going to go ahead and pull this one off, uh, uh, up right now. I'm going to stop that sharing. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pull it up right here. Uh, make this bigger. There is a colored version that's posted online. This is not the colored version, um, but it is posted. Um, so here, a claimed invention for Gears, Gears the Robot Cat. You notice that this also has some excellent trademarking, the, uh, the spelling, the GRS right there. Um, and remember, this is a claimed invention. And can, um, can Joyce or Tanaga, um, can you, can you or, or whoever else would like to, can you chime in and tell me what, what do you mean by claim? Adam, is is the the lesson supposed to be up there? Because all I see we just I just see a spinning on your screen. Maybe my computer. So Adam, happy to chime in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what we mean by claims, um, pretty much at the office, we always talk about claims defining the meets and bounds of the invention. So pretty much whatever's in those words that we actually call our claims those are the things that people or the courts will will use to determine what you really meant by your invention so the claims define the invention if it's in the other parts of the application but not included in the claim then it's not your invention so basically if you're a math teacher claims equal invention c equals i mm -hmm. and then what you'll see here at the bottom of the activity, um, so the students have to make a claimed invention. So they're gonna kind of recreate or reverse engineer, um, I believe it's for Miss Pat, and that's for Cat Gears, and it's a toy, but there's some stipulations. They have to make it from the claim. So just how we saw 
Um, if we've gone further into past the abstract of the um, smoke alarm, we would have seen claims particularly about a smoke alarm. And these claims are kind of, you can think of them as gotta have it lists. You can think of it as a criteria that you're gonna grade something by, but a pet. So they have to make a toy for a pet, compromising an elongated mobile device having front and back end, a head attached to said front legs. And now there is a particular term, I think Joyce mentioned this, I noticed it on some feedback we have. So the toy as claimed in claim one. So that is a particular kind of language. What is the, the term that you would describe this language that we see in a patent? Is it patent specific language or is there a more technical term? Well, Juan or Joyce or Tsnaga, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the claim language is definitely tech, um, it's a descriptive. So like Tanaga was saying, it describes the meets and bounds of the claim. So um, in the unlikely event or likely event that this um, it gets challenged in court, a judge is going to go to directly to the claims to see exactly what the claimed invention is. And that's how um, infringement will be determined using the, the claim language of, of those claims. No. So that's technical in, in nature. Yeah, and in this activity, you'll see here that students, you know, they have to make something for ears and eyes, um, a means of polling. So this one tells them what they have to do, but it doesn't tell them the things that they must use to make it. Um, there is some stipulations on color here, but you could change that. They could color paper. Um, you could take it out. <clears throat> um, but in this activity, we build on that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing one second. Um, by asking students. All right, awesome. Um, by asking students to really tease out that claims evidence reasoning. Um, so here, um, here's those claims evidence reasoning again, but we're asking students to provide um, an image. So a picture or a drawing of how their toy for the cat meets each claim and then tell me how that meets that. So it's a bit redundant, but it's very clearly claims evidence reasoning. So it's very much that common core standard um, in NGSS, that's like, uh, was it communicating evidence, argument from evidence, argumentation. So it's a very integrated kind of a thing. And this is kind of that last activity. So after they've talked about something, they've sought how it's similar to something that they've had, they've explored a patent. And now instead of just making claims from evidence that's provided, they have to create that evidence and then explain their reasoning to a claim. So it goes through claim evidence reasoning process um, throughout all four of these lessons, they're just a little situated differently. Even going back to the uh, who are innovators activity, depending on which pre-lesson you do, um, if you do the USPTO one, the PDF, the whole online, they'll explore patents of skis and you claim evidence reasoning there. Um, we adapted some lessons to be on, offline and I'll ask them about key terms, um, even research some of the companies or inventions they had made, and that will also again be a guide to reflection where they are generating evidence and making claims. So this lesson really builds nicely on claims evidence reasoning. Um, and here I just have this sorted out from the major claims, sub claims. Um, and then yeah, I think that is, let's move on now to here because on the discussion question, I will get back to it. All right. So I would like you to get into breakout groups for about five minutes and think about um, what can your students actually use? Remember, we're doing asset-based thinking again. We're going to focus on what they have, um, like hot glue. I'm not sure. Um, you know, what do they have? What can it be? I mean, they could build it with rocks, maybe springs. They could take something apart. So go into those breakout rooms and think about what do your students physically have that they could make something to match those claims with. And the breakouts, I believe, will be five minutes, and you'll get the warning, and you'll come back just like before. Uh, we're back. There you go. Okay. Wow. Awesome. So if you don't mind uh, putting in your chat any, any novel or materials or thoughts that you have that, that your students could use to complete this activity. Corn, potato, and sticks, probably. 
look for different communities access think of it as no tech use simple cheap materials things like yeah toilet paper rolls trees sticks remote yeah big challenge for ability resources for students yeah it, it is definitely something um suggestions so they're more creative yeah so so uh, Tammy noticed don't give suggestions for they're more creative and that's something that I would I would yeah bar so I would let um, each teacher decide I um, I like to give poor examples in my teaching um, or like 50% completed examples um, you know you could send it with a picture they may already have a cat so they could think about you know what would their cat actually play with and start from there um, yeah, yogurt, rock, rock tape, wires, paper clips. Yeah, uh, supply bags. Yes, you could definitely say there's supply bags. Using what you have in your imagination run wild. Yep. Um, and also, um, so I don't know, um, for, for things like this, if you're particularly a teacher in a small community, you might be able to do no contact drop-offs um, talk with your school about that make sure that they'd be okay with it but like you can make your, your, your cat toy for another student post it and maybe exchange it um, and they could use it with their cat and actually test it out um, later on in the series we'll be talking about design a backpack activity uh, where students would interview and design backpacks uh, for other folks in their class so they could you know potential for them to meet in those non asynchronous those uh, non secret asynchronous ways of how can we both be here, exchange things, have a shared experience, but not necessarily meet, um, you know, physically. So thinking about ways like that. Uh, all right. And so I, um, I attended a teacher workshop by the USPTO, and then I, with our other pre-college program teachers we work with, so this was, you know, full supplies, it was stocked, and here's where some items that they used tongue depressors, strings, corks. Granted, this would be if it wasn't a standard classroom. So say after this, you want to do this in the classroom. Um, these were things that um, the person who made the cat face with like the stuff inside and all that, she's a cat mom, as she told me. So she, she told me she knew how to make a good cat toy. Um, and so those were just some examples that uh, we had um, that we used on our end. Um, and then um, a last summary, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Um, so, oh, and also if I could have a reminder to everyone to mute their microphone. I was made aware that there was some feedback um, during the breakout, so if you could. Um, so innovation and household items. So thinking again, who are interviewers? That one looks at the extreme sports, innovators, gets them thinking. There's an online video, there's an offline version. There's also a full USPTO extension, which is in PDF. They would all start um, with that question of who are innovators? And from that, we move to the innovation timeline, thinking about something that has changed um, in three stages, um, interviewing a family member or another person about that. Um, so that builds that kind of local contextual home connection, spot the invention. So thinking about how inventions are all around us, intellectual property is everywhere, it's very ubiquitous. There's an internet access required for uh, spot the invention at USPTO Kids. Um, there's also an offline version. Secondly, a claimed invention for uh, a, a toy for Gears, Gears the Robot Cat, craft supplies. I suggest that if, you're, if your students particularly have, uh, they have rich technological resources, I would say that they could take pictures of it and then put them into the Word document and then have the file there. So they would, they would essentially take it with their phone, email it to them, put it in the Word document and send it to you. If you're working with students with that resource, I think that's a really interesting way because they could even label the picture. So it is kind of that lesson in, in redundancy, but that's the point. You have claims, you have evidence, and how you connect the two, that's your reasoning. And that's what you're gonna push them for, to do in that activity. Um, and so we have about four minutes of extra times. Um, so um, I just want to, before we open it up for questions and such, I just want to say a big thank you to the um, United States Patent uh, and Trademark Office, their Office of Education and Outreach. Thank you, Juan and Joyce. Um, Tanaga um, and anyone else from that office that jumped on and that contributed to the resources that we adapted, uh, begged and borrowed <laughs> from you. Um, so we really appreciate that and all the hard work you've done and all the editing and helping to make this possible. Um, we really appreciate that. Also, a uh, big thank you to uh, Jay Well, uh, Emily Nicholson, who's on the call, um, Dominique Brooks, Sue Ann, and Cami Hammersmith. 
Um, and if I'm forgetting anyone, I'm sorry, uh, but they all helped us uh, pull this together. Uh, Susan Rowe, who made all this awesome formatting that you'll see, but she's not on the call. Um, so thank you for, for pulling that together. Um, and then thank you participants for being here. Uh, we would have just an empty room with just us like six people and be pretty bored if um, the other folks of you didn't come. So thank you. So now um, you can take your, um, you can either, you can just submit your question in the chat and I will, um, I will share it out the best that I can. So if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put it into the chat and I will read it off um, and try to answer it the best I can. Um, or if there's a big vote and everyone like, show me the, show me the Word documents, I can go over there and pull them up on my screen, but they should have been emailed to you and they're available online. Um, so if there's any questions, um, just reply in chat. As a teacher, I know that no questions means it went awful. So if I don't get any questions, that is what I'm going to think. Um, yeah, so Tammy asked about PDs and PDUs. I believe we are offering PDs and PDUs uh, for this session. Yes. Uh, if someone doesn't mind adding the online uh, link to the resources on the web page, um, Tana would like that. But yes, Tammy, we are offering PDs and PDUs. Uh, Sue Ann, do you want to? Have yeah. So we have we have a certificate because we do that for our other programs too. So uh, we'll we have your contact information through the registration. So yes, we will we will give you a PDU for this one or any of the other nine that we do. So yes, that will we will put that in the mail. Awesome, and I believe someone's working on adding that link to the chat. Um, what about the other ones? So the other ones, Tammy, that we're talking about, um, thinking about doing in this session. Um, the next one will be on Holland Codes and Ocean Careers. That one will be geared towards more of seniors and middle school, and that will help them think about their personal interests um, related to career codes. Um, Dominic Brooks knows a heck of a lot about that. And so then we will um, help them think about their interests related to careers and then um, related to some ocean sciences. Um, Emily Nicholson just posted the link right there in the chat. So if you want to flip over, you can see the resources. You just click on the title and they drop down. They're all right there. Um, and the one after that one, um, I think is going to be a human center design one. And we're going to be looking at making uh, the backpacks and also thinking about making uh, medical masks. So kind of an engineering at home resources. What can they make uh, during this time? Uh, we're going to be using human centered designs, which means they start with someone and empathy. So we'll be talking about empathy and how that informs our design process. Um, but it'll still be about innovation and invention and technology. Um, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Juan, Snaga, everyone else. Thank you very much. Um, if there's any last questions, I think that's about it. I think that I just wanted to say, I think Jay will have the list of all the workshops sessions will that will be available probably in the next day or so the list of all 10 of them so you can look at the topics yes and we will later on be having some guests um guest lecturers i will just like these very generous and nice USP, uspto folks um we will be having some faculty members attend one or two of them from osu um it will be building on some graduate student research i believe um so these are all tied into certain other adventures uh that uh, pre-college programs has and other funders we work with. Um, so thank you. All right, so thank you very much. Have a great day. I'm gonna go ahead, I guess, and end the meeting um, or if, if Dominique, if you don't mind ending the meeting and yeah, have a great day. <laughs>